People like big events. In fact, so many times when there's a big event, event coming up, you know that people, you know about it because people are looking forward to it and they're talking about it. And then it happens and they're all excited and then what do they do? They talk about it. So beforehand, they're talking about it and what's going to happen or what they think will happen. And, and, and then afterwards, they say, well, this happened and that happened. And they, they keep talking about it and, and, and they, they'll go over and over and over again. There's one event that, that happens once a year that people talk about all the time. People will focus on it. And I might even say sometimes people will obsess over this event. And I'm talking about the Super Bowl. The football championship. The Super Bowl. I mean, people will talk about it all year round. Now, I'm a sports fan, and I do listen to sports radio. But I have to admit, I get tired of hearing about football. Because I'm not a huge football fan. But, anyways, people talk about it all the time. I mean, I understand that the week before the Super Bowl, that it's nonstop Super Bowl talk. And I understand that maybe the week after the Super Bowl, you might talk about what happened and what happened. But people talk about the Super Bowl all year long. Whether it's what happened last year or what they think might possibly happen next year. And at the beginning of the season, this is the beginning of football season, there's a few weeks in. But at the beginning of the season, before a single game has ever been played, People have already made their picks of who they think will win the Super Bowl. And throughout the season, the discussion will be, am I right or am I wrong? Were you right? Were you wrong? Who will win? Oh, this guy got hurt or didn't. So it's not. You can see the discussion keeps on going. Now, I'm not trying to pick on football fans here this morning. <laughs> I'm just giving one example. There are many. But one example of how big events shape our lives. But the thing is that some events are more important than others. I mean, your favorite football team, or I'll get off football, what about your baseball team or your favorite basketball team? Winning the championship can be exciting and it can be fun. But does it really change your life? I don't think so. On the other hand, there are some events that do change your life. And some events that ev have even changed the course of history. And this morning and next week, we're going to talk about two events that did just that. Changed the course of history. I'm talking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you're talking about the death and res resurrection of Jesus, you could say they change everything. They stand at the middle of history. All of history looked forward to the death of Jesus. And then now we look back to it as we look forward to Jesus' return. Now think about this for a minute. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and God said, here, you can eat from any tree, just don't eat that one. And they chose to disobey God. They chose to sin. They chose to eat from that tree. And God came down and he talked to them and he was disciplining them or pronouncing the curses on them because of sin. He said, this is what's going to happen because you disobeyed me, because you sinned, because you did your own thing rather than what I told you to do. From now on, Adam, you're going to have to work hard. I mean, you had work before, but it was all fun and blessing. But now it's going to be hard. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to work. And he said to Eve, he says, in the Eve, you're going to have pain, greatly multiplied pain in childbirth. And he also said, and you know what? Your relationship's not going to be simple either because you're going to be after each other. And then he talked to the serpent. And he cursed the serpent and said, you're going to crawl on your belly all the days of your life. But then he said something else. And he was talking about the seed or the descendants of the serpent, the descendants of the, oh, excuse me, the descendant of the, the woman, Eve, and the serpent. And he says, you know what? There's going to be enmity. There's going to be hatred. There's going to be, you guys are going to be enemies. And he made this word. He said that, the, that the, the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman's descendant. 
But that man, that descendant of the woman, would crush the head of the serpent. And at the very beginning of history, right after people sinned for the first time, God was giving them a promise. He was promising that someone was going to come and make things right. That Jesus would come and he would die on the cross and in dying on the cross would crush the head of the serpent, would put Satan in his place. The Satan, the serpent, Satan who came and, and, and tempted humanity to sin, to turn away from God. And he says that the Jesus will come and he will make things right. And so from the very beginning of history, when man sinned, from the very beginning, we were looking forward to the time when Jesus was coming, was coming to make things right and to save us and to deliver us from our sins. So the cross stands at the center of history. And now, even though we look back, the cross has already happened, we look back, we're looking forward to, to, to Jesus' return. We look forward to eternity, but we look back to the cross and remember what he did for us, that he brought us salvation and that we have eternal life because of his death and resurrection. So I say that the cross is the central event of history. When Jesus Christ, the innocent Son of God, took our sin upon himself and was judged and took God's wrath in our place. That's what we're talking about today. This central event in history. And the first thing that we see in our passage today is that Jesus suffered injustice. Let's look at verses 1 through 5 of chapter 15. It says, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, we need to remember, last week we looked at the previous passage, and we saw that Jesus had been arrested the night before. And after he was arrested, he was accused and questioned by the high priest and, and the council. Excuse me, and the other leaders, the high priests and the other Jewish leaders had condemned Jesus to, de to death, claiming that he had committed blasphemy, making less of God, making God smaller than he is, or talking against him. So they want to put him to death. And the thing is, is only Rome legally had the right to carry out capital punishment at this point in time. And so all the Jewish leaders, they get together in order to form a plan. Now, Roman trials usually took place at, at dawn. And so they didn't have a whole lot of time. They had to get their plan ready and they had to get Jesus over to have him put on trial because they wanted him put to death. But why did they need to come up with a plan? Well, first of all, they had to convince Pilate to put him to death. Think about that for a minute. Pilate was a Roman. And Pilate was someone who didn't really like the Jews a whole lot. In fact, they didn't get along. They were actually always doing things that kind of upset each other. Pilate would take and he'd set up images of Caesar in Jerusalem. And the, the Jews would be very upset about that because it was like it was an affront to God. And so they, they were doing these things. They had to convince that man who they didn't really get along with to do what they wanted him to do. Secondly, the reason why they had condemned Jesus was for blasphemy. Do you think Pilate and the Romans cared one bit about whether Jesus had committed blasphemy against the Jews' God? No. It was something that they didn't care about at all. So they needed to have a plan. They needed to have a reason that Pilate might put Jesus to death. Well, Jesus had claimed to be the Messiah. And as the Messiah, you are the king. The king of the Jews. And so then if he's the king, then you could say, well, he's a rival political leader to those of Rome. And if that's true, then you are a threat to Rome and they're therefore committing treason. This is their plan. You see, if he's a king, if he's the king of the Jews, that could be a problem for Rome. And if he's revolting against, excuse me, revolting against Rome, they won't be too happy about it. 
So Pilate asked Jesus straight out, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers. He says, you have said so. Now when Jesus says you have said so, he's not trying to be like coy. He's not trying to avoid the answer. He's not trying to, you know, to be a troublemaker or, 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 or hide anything. He's, he's basically saying yes. But when Jesus says that he's the king of the Jews, he's thinking of it in a slightly different way than what Paul, Pilate is thinking of. Because Jesus isn't saying, yeah, I'm a political leader and I'm here to overthrow Rome. But he is saying, yes, I am the king of the Jews. And we're told that the priests they just kept piling on the accusations. and They wanted to make sure Jesus is not going to get off anyways. But what does Jesus do? He stands there silently. He says nothing. And Pilate is amazed by this because it's very unusual for someone to be on trial and not to defend themselves. But Jesus stands there and says nothing. Now the thing is, Pilate doesn't seem to buy what the Jewish leaders are saying. But Jesus isn't giving Pilate a whole lot of help here in setting him free. Pilate doesn't seem to think that he's guilty, but Jesus isn't helping him get off. So why is Jesus silent? Well, the reason why Jesus is silent is because this is God's plan. And he knows he, not, he needs to go to the cross. He has to die. Now, here's some irony in this. And, and really, this passage is, is dripping with irony. And I'm going to pull out some things. I'm going to mention some points of irony as we go through this passage. But not all of them, but some of them. But here's the irony here. Jesus is innocent. And we also know that Jesus is a, was a very good speaker. You know what that means? If Jesus actually started talking, you know what would happen? He'd be set free. If he defended himself, he'd be set free. Because he had done nothing to be guilty of, and he had a very good way of speaking his way. Or could have spoke his way out of it because he was a very good speaker. So the irony here is that it would just be too easy for him, and he has to be quiet. Because he, he, he can't go free. He has to die in order to save us from our sins. So he has to be quiet so he doesn't get set free so he can go to the cross and pay for our sins. Well, let's keep reading in verse 6. He says, Now at the feast, he used to release, we're talking about Pilate here, at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You see, Pilate doesn't know what to do here. He doesn't think that Jesus is guilty of anything, at least nothing worthy of death. And he knows that the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, have handed him over uh, out of envy. In other words, they did it because they don't like him. Or they don't like what he's doing. He's causing problems for them. And so Pilate comes up and he says, he has this idea, I'm going to use this custom. He tries to use this custom that they had in order to get out of making a decision, of, of, of making a verdict. And so they had this custom. It was a way of showing goodwill, because I told you, Pilate and the Jews, they didn't get along real well. So it was one way that they could show goodwill. And the custom was that they would release someone, one prisoner, during Passover. And so the people come and they ask for it, and he thinks, okay, I can do this. And if I release Jesus, then I don't have to make a decision. And I can just let it go. And I believe he expects the crowd, you know, the regular people, the non-leaders, the crowd to want Jesus to be set free. But the people actually ask for Barabbas. And Barabbas... I mean, they're convinced by the priests to do it. But Barabbas was an actual criminal. 
He was someone who was a revolutionary. He was probably a leader in the revolution that was happening, whatever happened, the insurrection that happened. But we're also told he's a murderer. So he had killed someone in this insurrection, in this revolution. He'd recently been arrested and he was awaiting trial and then would be condemned or executed. And I think about this crowd that cried out, said, give us Barabbas. Now it's possible that some people in that crowd were actually followers of Barabbas or friends of Barabbas or supporters of Barabbas. And so they were like, they wanted Barabbas. But we're also told here that the chief priests stirred them up to ask for Barabbas. So even if there were some of his people in the crowd, not all of them were. But yet they still asked for Barabbas. Now what would cause the people to go to that point where they would actually ask for Barabbas to be set free rather than Jesus? And even to go further than that and ask for Jesus to be crucified? How could they be convinced to do that? Well, I have a few answers, possible th ways that this might have happened. One, it was early in the morning in Jerusalem. So most of that crowd was probably people who lived in Jerusalem. There were people from all over in Jerusalem at that time for the Passover, but many of them who traveled in lived or stayed outside of the town. And they would stay like maybe even on the hills. They might camp on the hills, or, you know, Mount of Olives, and those, or, or stay at other people's houses outside of town. So it's early in the morning, and it's most likely that many of the people who were there that morning were there, uh, were, were residents of Jerusalem. And you might think it may have been a different response if it was a Galilean crowd, people from outside of the Jerusalem area or Judea who knew Jesus and followed Jesus more. Secondly, it's more likely that this Jewish crowd would listen and follow the lead of their religious leaders, their spiritual leaders, rather than Pilate, the Roman. So Pilate's saying, I don't see anything wrong with him. Why would I kill him? But their religious leaders are all saying, tell him to crucify Jesus. Tell him to set Barabbas free. Now, who would they most likely listen to? The hated Roman? Or their Jewish leaders. That makes sense. A third thing is there's a good chance that a large part of this crowd was made up of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. Now there were 71 men who sat on the Sanhedrin, on the Jewish religious the, the council. And so just if those men were there, or a majority of them were there, that's a good-sized crowd. And if they had gone out on the way to the trial and gathered up their friends and their buddies, you've got a crowd here that is opposed to Jesus already. And so there are a lot of reasons we can think of here why this crowd might have called out for the crucifixion of Jesus. But what we see here is Pilate is in talking, he finds no guilt in Jesus. But then he puts the decision in the hands of the Jewish people. He frees Barabbas from death. For the death from the death penalty, and he turns Jesus over to be put to death. Now I want you to notice some irony here. Pilate, the Roman, the ungodly one, sees it, that Jesus is innocent and is trying to set him free. He doesn't try too hard. But he sees that Jesus is innocent, and he tries to set him free. But God's people are insisting that Jesus be put to death. God's people are insisting that the Son of God be put to death. God's people are insisting that the one he sent to deliver them be put to death. That just seems crazy. But Pilate, wanting to appease the Jews, condemns Jesus to death, even though he knows he's innocent. <coughs> Jesus suffered great injustice. He did not deserve the cross. He did not deserve to be condemned. He was never found guilty, really. But he was put to death anyway. Jesus suffered great injustice, but he knew God's plan. And as Peter said, he entrusted himself to God, to the one who judges justly. 
In other words, he said, this is God's plan. I trust him. And he went forward. He trusted that God would do what's best. And did what he told him to do. So he suffered a great injustice, but he also suffered abuse. Let's keep reading in verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. So they mocked Jesus. Now this is possibly also a mockery of the Jews as a whole. You know, kind of like, here's someone who's claiming to be a king. Here's someone who claims that maybe the Jews could revolt and uprise and, and, and remove themselves from the power of the Romans. And they don't believe that. They're just like, that's not possible. Like, who do you think you are? You're weak. You're the Jews. You're not, you can't beat us. But they're specifically mocking Jesus here. They're mocking him for claiming that he's a king. As if to say, who would dare think you could exert any authority over Rome? And to them, it's amusing. It's a joke. And they've made Jesus into a joke. And they make up this king costume. They put on the, 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 the robe. And they put on a, a crown of thorns on his head. And Matthew tells us they also handed him a staff like to represent a king's scepter. And this may be the reed that is mentioned here in Mark that, where he says that they beat him over the head with it. But do you catch the irony in this picture? They have no idea who they're mocking. They are taunting Jesus as if he has no power at all. They are taunting Jesus as if he has no significance at all. He's just some guy who made a claim. But Jesus is actually very powerful. Jesus is actually very significant. But they don't know it. And they also don't know that they are only able to do what they are doing right now because he is allowing them to do it. And not only that, but they are mockingly paying homage to him. But he is the one who deserves their true honor. He is the one who deserves their submission. He is the one who they owe homage to and worship to. But they are abusing him instead. It's ironic, but it's also very sad. So Jesus suffered injustice and abuse. But why did he do this? Why did he do it? He... He suffered to pay for our sins. It was the only way that we could be set free. Look at verse 21. So he had been led out to be crucified. Verse 21, it says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews... And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. 
Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So Jesus is hung on the cross and we're told here that there was darkness over the whole land. And this darkness is a picture, it's a physical picture of what is actually happening here with Jesus. God was judging humanity's sin. If you can read in Amos chapter 8, you would see that he has another, uh, he uses a very similar image of darkness and in a time of judgment. It talks about God judging Israel for their sin. And in verse 9 of Amos chapter 8, he says this, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. You see that picture? So in the middle of the day, when it should be absolutely bright, it's going to be dark. And God says, I'm going to do this. And it's in the middle of this passage that's talking about God's judgment. So it's a picture of God's judgment on sin. And here when Jesus is hanging on the cross, God is turning his, his eyes away from Jesus. When he became sin for us, when he took all of our sins upon himself and was being judged for that, for our sins, punished for our sins. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is actually a quote from Psalm 22, 1. And in Psalm 22, it has, it, 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 the person who writes the psalm is, is a righteous person who is suffering. Who is suffering in injustice, who is suffering from, at the hands of other people. But he's a righteous person who is suffering and he calls out to God. And he claims that he has been abandoned by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken or abandoned me? Well, in Psalm 22, also this, this person, though he is righteous, he's being mistreated by other people. And they are actually mocking him for trusting in God. And he is suffering, but he also expects that in the end, God will come to his aid. And that's where I think it's very key that when he cries out to God, what's he say at the very beginning? He says, my God, my God. He still expects that God is there or that God will be there. He still has that relationship with God. And so it is with Jesus. Jesus knows that God will vindicate him in the end. And he does through the resurrection. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it shows that he did not deserve this death he was given. And he did not deserve the condemnation that he was unjustly given. But he is vindicated. But Jesus knows that God will vindicate him. But now he is suffering under God's judgment on sin. Right now, he has been abandoned by God. But when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He used the words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And Eloi kind of sounds a little like Elijah. And somebody who heard it said, hey, they, they, they think he's calling out for Elijah. Now there's a popular Jewish thought that Elijah comes to the, uh, to the aid of righteous sufferers. And so someone says to him, hey, hold on. And they offer him some wine, probably to refresh him, give him some little strength. And they said, let's see if Elijah will save him. Now, they're most likely still mocking him. <laughs> like, let's see if Elijah will save him. He's crying out to Elijah, let's see if it helps. But then Jesus dies. But right before he dies, he cries out with a loud cry. We're told a loud cry. And there's some significance to this. The thing about crucifixion, crucifixion was a long, torturous way to die. I mean, you died, when you were crucified, you died a uh, exhausted, and, 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 and suffocating death. And it took a long period of time, sometimes even up to like three days. 
And when you died, you died really with no strength. And oftentimes people would be passed out or even in a coma when they finally died. But Jesus didn't die that way. Jesus had strength to cry out with a loud voice. And then he dies. We also know that he died much earlier than what we'd be expected. Because when they go to Pilate, and we'll see in the next chapters, and they ask Pilate, can we have his body? Pilate says, he's dead already? So he died quickly. He died with much strength. But he died. I just realized I skipped a whole bunch. Um, I'm going to back up. Well, Mark said that he had been crucified. But really that's all. He doesn't explain the crucifixion. He doesn't explain how it happened or any of that kind of stuff. Because his original readers, they knew it. They understood it. They didn't need an explanation. But he does give us a few details here about the crucifixion. One, it says that he was offered wine mixed with myrrh. And maybe this was by a soldier or maybe a sympathetic bystander. But the reason why they would offer this is because it was used as a painkiller, as a way of kind of numbing the senses. Um, and, and, but Jesus refused. He refused it. He chose to die or to suffer, go through this with a clear mind and in control of all his senses. Secondly, we're told that they divided his clothes and they cast lots for them, which fulfilled Psalm 22. The third detail he tells us is that there was an inscription of the charge above his head that he was king of the Jews. Now, normally the Romans would do that. They would put up a sign that said, this is why this person is being put to death. And actually, crucifixion was a good deterrent because as you walked by and you saw these people suffering and you saw the charge, you would say, I don't want to do that. And so they would put this sign up there and it said that he was being put to death because he was king of the Jews. The other detail he tells us is that there were two robbers. And he tells us that both were mocking him. Now Luke tells us that one of them said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So apparently at some time along the day, sometime in those, those six hours, he changed his tune. And he believed in Jesus. And the fifth thing he tells us is that people made fun of Jesus. Those who were passing by made fun of Jesus. Now you have to realize when, the, again, because the, the Romans wanted to use crucifixion as a, to make example of people and say, don't do this, that they did it right next to the main roads. So what people would pass by and would see what was happening. And so here we have some people passing by. And the people who pass by, they, they, they say to Jesus, or they say, you, know, you who said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, come down off the cross. In other words, perform a miracle and get off the cross. If you're so miraculous that you could rebuild this temple that took years and years to build in three days, come off the cross. And so they're mocking him again, saying, we don't believe you can do these miraculous things. You can't even save yourself. And then the chief priests and the scribes, they are talking to each other and they say this. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Now, you've got to catch the irony in that. You see, they knew what Jesus had done. They knew he was able to do the miraculous. They knew he had healed people of their sins. He knew that they had, he had cast demons out of people. They knew he had performed miracles. They admit it, but they refuse to believe that Jesus is who he is. They say, come down on the cross that we might see and believe. They had already seen many miracles, but they refused to believe. So there's darkness over the land, and Jesus is put to death. He dies with strength, and he cries out with a loud voice and dies. But we're told two other things that he says. And I didn't read these last verses. Let me go ahead and read them. Verse, beginning in verse 33. It says, When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders were hearing it, hearing it said, Behold, he, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see if, whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So there's two other things that he said that happened when Jesus died. When Jesus died, the first thing is, he tells us, is that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. It was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that God did it. Now this curtain was the place, the thing that separated the people from the symbolic presence of God in the temple. And so that curtain symbolized something that, that was in the way between people and God. And when Jesus died on the cross, that that curtain was torn in two. God tore that temple, that, that curtain in two. And the tearing of that temple, of that curtain, symbolized the end of the need, need for repeated sacrifices in, to, in order to approach God. And it symbolized that there was a new way to freely approach God, and that was through Jesus. That his death on the cross was the only sacrifice that paid for our sins, so we could come directly to God. And just as a side note, if you were to read Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says that many priests believed in Jesus. Now here's the thing. When Jesus was on the cross, there would have been some priests serving in the temple. And some of those priests would have saw that, that, that curtain tear. And when they saw that curtain tear, they understood and believed in Jesus. The second thing we're told that happened when Jesus died is that there was a centurion standing there who was, who was in charge of Jesus and he was at the feet of the cro foot of the cross and he saw the way Jesus died and we're told that he, he, he exclaimed, truly this man was the son of God. And when he says truly, that truly stands in, in, in contrast to everything else that was being said of, about Jesus. He says, truly, this man was a son of God. Now, he's responding to the cosmic things that has happened. I mean, the, the, the sky turning dark when it shouldn't have. And he's responding to the way Jesus died, everything that, that came and the unusual things that happened. But he says, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, what did, this, what did this centurion really believe about Jesus? I don't know exactly what he meant when he said that he was the son of God. Did he mean... I don't think he probably understood it in the fullest extent that we do. You have to remember, he was a Roman. He was a pagan, which means he was also a polytheist. He believed in many gods. And so he may have been thinking of, God, of Jesus in the sense like, like a, a divine man, like, like they believed of Caesar. Or he may have been thinking of him in the sense of someone who had a unique relationship with God. Now, both those things were true of, God, of Jesus. He was a divine man and he was a, had a unique relationship with God. But we know that he was more than just that. He is fully God and fully man. He may not have understood that to the fullest extent of, 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 as the way we do. But Mark does. And Mark is presenting it here for us to know that Jesus is the Son of God. Just like he said in the very first verse of this gospel. He says it's about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And Mark is making it very clear that he is the Son of God. Now talking about irony, can you get any bigger irony than that? The Son of God dying on a cross. But here's another great irony about the cross. Life begins at the cross. And here I'm talking about for us as human beings. True life, eternal life, begins at the cross. Because Jesus died for us to give us life. 
You see, without Jesus, without the Son of God dying, suffering and dying on that cross, we could not have life. We would have no hope. The innocent and holy Son of God died so sinners could be forgiven and live for eternity. That's why Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What we earned, what we deserve for our sin is death, separation from God forever, judgment for our sins. But Jesus died on the cross so that we could be set free from that judgment and be given eternal life so that we could spend eternity with him so we could be forgiven and become a child of God and we could live for him right now and have an eternity with him enjoying the blessings of God if you believe in Jesus trusting that his death on the cross paid the price for your sins you will be forgiven and be given eternal life as a child of God life begins at the cross And when we think about the innocent Son of God suffering and dying on the cross, I think there's some lessons for us here. That it may change our perspective on some things. Like how we respond when we suffer injustice. How do we normally respond? When we suffer an injustice, I think our tendency normally as humans is to lash out. We're going to get back. I mean, look at what's happening in our country right now. There have been injustices and there have been fights. We'll just kill back. Our natural tendency is to lash out when we suffer injustice. What did Jesus do? Jesus suffered the greatest injustice of all time. And Peter writes of Jesus in 1 Peter 2.23, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I just want to simply ask the question, can you trust God no matter what happens to you? No matter what is happening, whether it's just or unjust, can you trust God through it? And what about grace and forgiveness? When we think about grace and forgiveness, I mean, here we have the innocent Son of God who died so you and I could be forgiven. He showed us grace. And we may think about other people who have wronged us, who have done some injustice to us, who have done something that we don't like. And we may think he or she doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And you know what? It might be true. But we didn't deserve to be forgiven either. But God forgave us. We don't deserve what Jesus did on the cross. We don't deserve his forgiveness. We were opposed to God, doing our own thing, going our own way. And Jesus came and died for us to make us right. He did it anyway. And that's grace. That's love. And again, I just want to ask the question, can you do it like him? Can you show grace? Can you show love? And you know, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes we may need his help. But it is available. Can you show grace and love to those who have wronged you? The cross stands at the center of history. And we said life, true life, begins at the cross. In fact, life revolves around the cross. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we remember what he 
did for us and how he did it and why he did it. I believe it will change the way we think and it will change the way we live. Jesus truly is the Son of God. So let's follow him together. Let's live for him. And unlike those people we saw in our passage today, let's give him the honor that he alone truly deserves.